Today on the Matt Wall Show, the left continues to eat itself as a gay rights organization that had been around for 50 years voluntarily dissolves and disbands after BLM criticized it. This is a convoluted but also instructive, not to mention hilarious story, and we'll talk about it today. Also, five headlines, including Olivia Rodrigo's trip to the White House to promote vaccines, raising the question for many people, who is Olivia Rodrigo? And speaking of uh, BLM, they have finally spoken out about the situation in Cuba in order to defend the Cuban government, of course. And a state representative in Minnesota says that he was racially profiled during a traffic stop, but the body cam footage shows something else entirely. And in our daily cancellation, we will wade into the murky, confused, and toxic waters of abortion TikTok. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Now a word from my photo. You know, everywhere I go, uh, I am hounded by the paparazzi. It's just, that's just, that's, that's how it is to be a podcast host. Uh, only the paparazzi in this case is uh, just my wife because she's everywhere we go and everything we do, she wants to take pictures. And uh, I have a few problems with that, but one of, you know, one of my number one problems is that we, we take all these pictures and then they, they just stay on a phone and they don't, we don't do anything with them. And I think that's the case for most people, a lot of wasted pictures, which is why you need my photo. You're taking all these pictures, well, how about, what are you gonna do to, to actually cherish those moments? How about making it physical so that moment uh, that you capture doesn't just get lost on your camera roll? That's why you gotta check out my photo. It is, uh, it's awesome, it's easy to use, it takes literally two minutes to create a special product for your own wall or shelf, whatever you wanna do with it. They also make great gifts for your loved ones. My photo prints your image uh, directly on acrylic, glass, metal, and much more. So don't just leave it on your phone. Go to my photo. Uh, you need to go to myphoto.com and check it out. That's myphoto.com. Order today. You'll get 20% off your order, which will arrive in just five days. Prices start at just $12. Use code Walsh and get 20% off today at myphoto.com. Something that uh, those on the, of us on the right always enjoy and derive immense satisfaction from, somewhat sick satisfaction perhaps, but satisfaction nonetheless, are stories of the left turning on itself and its adherents devouring each other as they are prone to do. We've seen this phenomenon many times, and I think it might be interesting and useful to try and figure out why this happens exactly. But before we do that, let's look at the latest example. And it's a, it's a rather glorious example, I must say. Boston Pride is the group that organizes the city's pride parade and uh, other gay activities in the city. It's important to note that this organization has been around and active for 50 years, okay? Um, they, so uh, presumably one of the oldest, you know, gay rights organizations, I would assume, in the country. They've been um, major significant players in the gay rights world, and, 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 and yet recently they had come under fire from within their own ranks. A growing number of LGBT activists decided that Boston Pride is racist, because there are too many white people running the organization and too many white people attending the events. Now, I have no interest in, at all in defending Boston Pride, but I do feel compelled to point out that Boston Pride would naturally tend to be white simply because Boston, the city, is predominantly white. Unlike many other cities today, like, say, Baltimore, which is 62% uh, black, in Boston, the majority of residents are white. Just so happens making it not so shocking or scandalous that a majority of Boston Pride attendees are white. There are many other scandalous things that happen at those events, no doubt, but that isn't one of them. Nonetheless, you can't have too many white people, as we have learned, or too many, quote, cisgender people, which was another problem, apparently. And that's why local activists this past year, after uh, attacking Boston Pride as racist and even transphobic, decided to boycott the traditional event the traditional Pride event that I've been going on for 50 years, and hold their own. So this past month on June 12th, uh, 12th, you, you, and you may have missed this, I'm sorry if you did, but they had their first annual trans resistance march and vigil, led by, they said, queer and trans people of color. An article posted to Boston.com last month explains the reasoning for this competing event. It says, queer, trans, and black indigenous people of color, BIPOC activists, have been calling on Boston Pride to make changes since at least 2015, when Black Lives Matter demanded the organization diversify the board, allow BIPOC activists control of Black and Latino Pride events, and re-examine corporate sponsorships, among other things. Last summer, numerous Boston Pride volunteers resigned after the organization allegedly removed a statement supporting Black Lives Matter from a newsletter and called for all board members to step down in place of more representative leadership. 
According to the Boston Globe, Boston Pride's six member six members board has no black members, two Latino members, and one transgender member. Quote: My experience in working with the board is they experience um, is uh, community voices a- as antagonistic as opposed to thinking these are our people. This, according to Joe Tr- Triglio, who resigned from the Boston Pride communications team, telling the Globe, "Quote: They treat that as some sort of attack as opposed to what it is. People asking them to serve their needs and interests." Only one transgender board member out of six? Outrageous. Now, we know, of course, that trans people comprise far less than 1% of the population. But they must, in any case, comprise at least 50% of every organization, board, committee, panel, and television show cast. How can that even be possible? I mean, how can you take so few trans people and spread them so widely and visibly? Well, that's your problem. Figure it out. You have to be like Jesus, multiplying the loaves and fishes. Multiply the trans. It's a, you you got to figure out a way to do it. Whatever you need to do, get it done. The point is simply that this tiny fraction of the population must be seen everywhere all the time without exception. And Boston Pride, they failed in that regard, just as they failed by allowing too many white people to participate. And that's what ultimately led to this. As NBC reports today, after 50 years, Boston Pride is disbanding and dissolving itself in shame for the sin of being too white and also too not trans. This, according to NBC, it it says, quote, Boston Pride, the organization that, that has organized the city's pride celebrations for 50 years, has announced it is shutting down. The dissolution announced Friday afternoon in a statement on the group's website comes after the reportedly all-white board of directors has faced ongoing accusations of ignoring racial minorities and transgender people. It is clear to us that our community needs and wants change without the involvement of Boston Pride, the board said in its statement. We have heard the concerns of the QTBIBOC community and others. Uh, The QT BIPOC community and others, the statement continued, referring to queer and transgender people of color. We care too much to stand in the way. Therefore, Boston Pride is dissolving. There will be no further events or programming planned, and the board is taking steps to close down the organization. The board said the decision, quote, was made with a heavy heart out of love and hope for a better future. Now, you might be thinking, this is hilarious and great. A bunch of left-wing gay activists just nuked their own organization for no reason at all. What's not to love? And you're right, it is indeed hilarious and great, but aside from pointing and laughing, it might, as I said, be instructive to talk about why this sort of thing happens. Because it happens a lot. And to that end, I think there are three factors to consider. The first is this, very simply. Um, BLM exercises complete and total power on the left, and they know it. Nobody on that side of the ideological divide will oppose them or whisper the slightest objection. Even as BLM swoops in and eviscerates its own allies for no discernible reason. Leftists have already set the precedent that opposing Black Lives Matter, the organization, means opposing Black Lives Matter, the concept. Now, usually, the left can violate its own precedents at will. One standard for us, another standard for them. But this is one that even they have to abide by. Even they can't get away with violating this standard. Two, there's the victim hierarchy. Now, as as we know by now, victimhood is power on the left, which means that there is a constant struggle within its own ranks to claim the status of uber victim. That's why the top spot on the victim pyramid has changed hands several times over the years, especially in recent years, as one group and then another plants its flag there. As it stands right now, the coveted territory belongs to BIPOC, as they now call themselves, black and indigenous people of color. But it's not enough to be just black or indigenous. The top of the top, the ultimate power spot, belongs to those who can add additional identities, especially sexualized identities, which has given rise to now QTBIPOC, or queer and trans black indigenous people of color. Boston Pride was a mere LGBT organization. They didn't, they didn't make a move to innovate and become a QTBIPOC LGBT organization, and as such, have been left in the dust. A tragic tale as old as time. Three, I think most importantly, um, and the most fundamental reason why you, you see the left eat itself in this way so often, is that 
the entire ideology is intensely and almost solely self-focused. There cannot be any true community. As much as they talk about community, and they have so many different communities, um, and they talk about things like being an ally or allyship, that can't exist. Camaraderie, loyalty, none of that exists. Because they're all looking constantly back within themselves. I mean, to be a member of a real community, to have real camaraderie and loyalty, you have to look outward. You have to be concerned about something other than just yourself. But they are. That's the defining feature of leftism. It's an ideology, a religion of the self. That is what it is at its core, at its base. And it's how they come up with all these new self-identities and why they believe the whole world should cooperate with and affirm whatever new identities they invent. It's how we end up with, um, here's the latest, uh, it's how we end up with, with nonsense like this. Watch. So I'm not an expert or an authority on what neuroqueer means, but to simplify it and make it easier for you to understand, it's essentially... Um, on a base level, it's kind of where your neurodivergent identity and your queer identity, how they interact and intersect. This also extends to your other identities, such as your race, your socioeconomic class, your ethnicity, etc. And how those things also interact and intersect with your neurodivergence and your queerness. And some ways that some people may practice being neuroqueer can range from theoretical thought experiments, to social justice work methods. A good example may be something like deciding to represent your gender identity in an intentionally queer way as a way to subvert hegemonic ideas of gender performance. It's a fairly new term, so it is very fluid and the possibilities are endless. Oh, well, okay. Uh, subvert hegemonic ideas of gender performance. She says with piercings in her cheek. <laughs> now, Indeed, though, the possibilities are endless, as she says. Neuroqueer. Why not? Just another identity to add to the list. Hey, nothing you just heard there. there. There was not a coherent sentence uttered throughout that, that, that whole 56 seconds. Um, this, though, is what happens. This is another identity invented by someone who spends almost all of her time staring back into the abyss of her own ego. According to her religion, the leftist religion, which is also our state religion, by the way, nothing matters so much as how you feel. And it's not just how you feel. It's another thing that, the, that I think people on the right get wrong. Uh, on the left, they're always, they're so sensitive, they're focused on their feelings. Well, let's be more specific. It's not how you feel. It's about how you feel about yourself, your feelings about yourself. Everything comes back to yourself. Now, in a weird way, this is what makes leftism alluring and powerful, especially when it comes to kids and teenagers. It's one of the reasons why so many kids and teenagers gravitate in that direction. Because they tend already to be self-focused. Everyone has that capacity, that inclination, that instinct towards uh, egotism and narcissism. But it's also what makes leftism dysfunctional and volatile and prone to self-sabotage. And although all of this is very bad for the country and our future as a civilization and our species, it is also sometimes, at least, as is the case with this Boston Pride story, extremely funny. Now let's get to our five headlines. You know, I'm always telling you about rockauto.com because they're just the best option that you have available to you if you need auto parts rather than going to the store and dealing with all that, you can just go to rockauto.com. And uh, what's you know what's the best thing about rockauto.com for me? There's of course there's the convenience of it that you have it available on your phone or your computer. There's the really low prices as a cheapskate myself and a vowed cheapskate. That's that's an aspect I really personally enjoy. Um, but the thing that I like most about it when I've gone to rockauto.com is that it's very easy to navigate, and you can find exactly what you're looking for. Um, you don't have to know a lot about cars. You don't have to be tech savvy, which is good for me because I'm neither of those things. But you can go and you can find everything you need. All you're doing is you're just you're plugging in your, uh, what your vehicle is, whatever brand you want, specifications, the prices you prefer. And you can have it all laid out there for you. And you can't do that at the auto parts store. You know, it's not that simple at the auto parts store, but you can do that at rockauto.com. So 
Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And we want credit for it. So as always, remember to write Walsh in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you. All right. So first of all, Olivia Rodrigo was um, at the White House yesterday. And uh, one question I've seen a lot in, in relation to this, and she was there to, to talk about vaccines. We'll play the clip in a second. If you're wondering what Olivia R- Rodrigo's opinion is on vaccines. Um, but one question that's popped up a lot in relation to this is, uh, is who the hell is Olivia Rodrigo? And I'm, I'm, you know, usually I'm like everyone else. And this is how one of the ways I know that I'm old. I mean, I've been old since I was born, really. I was born this way. Um, but one of the ways I know that I'm old is that, is that, that I don't know so many famous people and I, I, that I have no idea who they are anymore. Uh, Olivia Rodrigo, I do know who she is because we did a YouTube video about her reviewing one of her, um, one of her great, one of her great songs. I, mean, I use the word great very loosely here. Um, so I know that she's a pop star. I can tell you that. This is how in touch I am with the youth. This one I know. She's a pop star. I think she originated with, uh, was it TikTok or like an Instagram or something? And then she made, or was that, was that somebody else I'm thinking of? Or was she a Disney? She came, either Disney or TikTok. That's, that's kind of the farm team for the pop stars these days. And um, anyway, so she was at the White House. And first, can we just show the clip? Here she is walking in. I just want to show you this picture of her walking into the White House in those uh, shoes there. I don't, I don't even know how you move in those shoes. I also didn't realize that those shoes were, were back in style, these platform shoes. I thought that was like, so that, that's back in style now, I guess. It's also been reported, um, Jack Posobiec reported on Twitter, that Jill Biden, there's a little bit of contention now in the White House because Jill Biden, Dr. Jill Biden, I should say, excuse me, thought, apparently, according to anonymous sources, thought that Olivia Rodrigo's shoes were not appropriate for the event. And I just think if she did say that, rushing to the defense of Olivia Rodrigo here as a big fan of hers, I mean, that coming from Jill Biden, of all people, who are you to talk? Might I remind you of that uh, dress that she wore a few weeks ago? Looked like it was stitched together from various, like, drapery around, around the White House. They just, tore, they just tore curtains down in drapes around the White House and just stitched it together. Some schizophrenic person stitched it together and put it on her. And she has the audacity to accuse people of... Lacking a fashion sense. Anyway, that's not really the important part. The important part is Livia Rodrigo was there to tell us about vaccines, and here she is. It's important to have conversations with friends and family members, encouraging all communities to get vaccinated and actually get to a vaccination site, which you can do more easily than ever before, given how many sites we have and how easy it is to find them at vaccines.gov. Well, there it is. Olivia Rodrigo has spoken. So, they're going door to door. They're bribing you. They're, they're beating you over the head, perhaps literally in some cases, um, doing everything they can. And if you're still not convinced, well, here's Olivia Rodrigo, pop star. And if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. They had juvenile vax that ass up. I mean, what else do they have to do to get you to put this substance into your body? All right, next, uh, Black Lives Matter, speaking of which, they put out a statement, finally, on the situation down in Cuba. And they'd, they had been uh, basically silent about it until now. And the statement is rather lengthy. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it will shock you to, to, to learn that uh, Black Lives Matter, they've looked at what's happening down in Cuba, people protesting the tyranny of the communist government, And Black Lives Matter has decided they know who's at fault. Uh, America is at fault. It's our fault. It's our government, not theirs. So this is their statement in part. It says Black Lives Matter condemns the U.S. federal government's inhumane treatment of Cubans. And uh, not the the Cuban government. According to reports, they're, they're right now killing protesters. Black Lives Matter speaking up and saying, we condemn the inhumane treatment of these protesters by the U.S. federal government. Uh, This cruel and inhumane policy 
instituted with the explicit intention of destabilizing the country and undermining Cubans' right to choose their own government is at the heart of Cuba's current crisis. Since 1962, this United States has forced pain and suffering on the people of Cuba by cutting off food, medicine, and supplies, costing the tiny island nation an estimated $130 billion. Without that money, it is harder for Cuba to acquire medical equipment needed to develop its own COVID-19 vaccines and equipment for food production. This comes in spite of the country's strong medical care and history of lending doctors and nurses to disasters around the world. The people of Cuba are being punished by the U.S. government being murdered by their own government, but, but no, the real punishment is from us because the country has maintained its commitment to sovereignty and self-determination. This is uh, not just attacking the United States. This is a full-throated defense of the communist Cuban government. Never mind that much of what's being said here is just factually wrong. Simply not true, much of it. But it's a defense of... of the Cuban, and of course it is. What else are they going to say? They're a communist organization, avowedly so. And they also have no problem. They don't have any problem with violence, clearly. It doesn't bother them that people are being killed. They certainly don't value human life. All they care is about, the, the, is about power, their own power, number, first and foremost and the end ideological goal. That's all they care about. Now, I have noticed um, there's, there's been a lot of criticism of Black Lives Matter for this statement, which is good. They deserve to be criticized for it. I've even noticed some conservatives, conservative commentators and so on, uh, coming out pretty strong against Black Lives Matter for this. Again, well-deserved, fine. But some of those, some of those commentators... As far as I can tell, this is the first time they've come out strong against Black Lives Matter. You know, I'm old enough to remember, like, I don't know, nine months ago, up to nine months ago, or even more recently, where if you criticize Black Lives Matter and called them what they are, an extremist communist organization, a terrorist organization, many different, many descriptions would fit the bill here. But you, you'd be attacked as racist, not just by the left, but even by some people on the right. You know, it, it, this is what frustrates me. It's one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter got to this point of being as powerful as they are. Because for years, they, they've been doing this for a while now. Going back to Ferguson and even slightly before that. And for years, people on the right, many of them either kept silent, refused to criticize them, or would actively defend them. And say, oh, no, they're just concerned with racial justice. Meanwhile, BLM, from its inception, this is why there is no excuse for people that were that oblivious. In fact, I don't believe that they were that oblivious. I think they were just cowardly. But from their inception... This has been a, a, an organization drenched in blood and violence and deception. Violence and deception has been their MO from, from the beginning. And it took, uh, it, it took years for, for it to be sort of a mainstream thing on, on, among conservatives to openly criticize BLM. And that's pathetic. And now, finally, this appears to be the last straw for, for a lot of people, which, great. Why did it take you so long? Let's move here. So the Freedom Fighters, as they're being called now, are still in D.C. Those are the Texas Democrats who fled the state. Uh, and now they're being branded, anyway, by Amy Klobuchar as Freedom Fighters. And she said this almost with a straight face. She almost accomplished saying it with a straight face. Here's uh, Klobuchar. of courage uh, with uh, freedom fighters uh, who came to Washington, D.C. Uh, to seek salvation because they are not going to be able to get that governor of Texas uh, to protect the voting rights of the people of Texas. We know that. Uh, in fact, instead of trying to make it easier for people to vote, uh, 
the governor and the Republicans in the legislature have done everything to make it harder, including uh, threatening these legislators over and over again. And they are standing their ground just as we are standing our ground. Freedom fighters seeking salvation. Uh, of course, that's nauseating. And, and, and I, you know, I, I said when, this, when all this first started a few days ago that uh, it's hard for me to even be angry at the Texas Democrats for doing this because they're doing the kind of thing that I wish Republicans would do far more often, which is playing hardball and uh, and and using the power that you have and also absolutely refusing to give the other side anything. That's the thing about Democrats. They are not going to give you an inch. They will not give you anything at all. Um, and that's what's happening here with these with these Democrats. It doesn't make them heroes at all, of course, right? They want they're they're taking a you know a vacation paid for by the taxpayers. They got their Miller Lite and they're on this little jaunt in D.C. and they're being celebrated and hailed as heroes everywhere they go. Which means they're not heroes. But I, it's hard for me to be mad at them for doing it for that reason. I know that most conservatives are, are pretty upset about it, and, and I'm saying to myself, all right. I I get the play. I understand the play. It's a smart play, I guess. But they, they do have the advantage, of course, that they've got the whole media on their side. They have the whole establishment on their side. They've got all of our cons- cultural institutions on their side. And you have to remember that as well. So I, I am constantly criticizing Republicans and I'll continue to criticize them for compromising way too much. And by compromising, it's not re- even really a compromise usually when Republicans do it because a compromise means... Uh, I give up some of the stuff that I, that I want and you give up some of the stuff that you want and then we meet in the middle. But with the, with the Republicans, the compromise is I'll give up everything and get nothing and just let you do whatever you want. But you also have to keep in mind, not to excuse Republicans at all, um, they don't have all of our cultural institutions on their side the way the Democrats do. So it's a lot easier for the Democrats to do this kind of thing. And all that to say, it doesn't make any of this any less nauseating to hear them hailed as freedom fighters seeking salvation. And speaking of nauseating, I, 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 I cannot let you escape having to listen to this. Uh, this was a couple of days ago. All those same Texas Democrats were out in front of the Capitol and they uh, spontaneously broke out into song. And it's, it's way worse than you even could imagine that it would be. Let's listen. I turn it back over to you for the questions and uh, thank you very much for all that you and all of your colleagues are doing here today. We will overcome. We will overcome. We will overcome someday. Deep in our hearts, I do believe we will overcome. Today. Thank you, Ms. T. <laughs> Thank you, members of Congress. Uh, we'll take a few questions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. They sound like a bucket of cats falling over a waterfall or something. That is some <laughs> one of the worst musical performances I've ever heard. I feel kind of bad for the two guys in the front there. Because they didn't know that was going to happen. You could tell they didn't know that was going to happen. And now they're stuck having to sing. And they're, and they're the ones right in front of the microphone. And you could tell they're doing the lip sync thing a little bit. Um, but this is... They, 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 well, they're, fr- they're freedom fighters singing We Shall Overcome. It's a, it's a very awkward performance, let's just say, that they're putting in here. Playing the part of, quote, freedom fighters. But they don't have to play it convincingly because, again, they got the media on their side. All right. Next, State Representative John Thompson of Minnesota was uh, pulled over a couple of weeks ago um, in St. Paul. And surprise, surprise, he immediately decided that he was uh, racially profiled. And 
I don't know how well we can hear this, but here he is at, he was at, he was, uh, he, he was pulled over. This is on, I don't know, July 5th or 6th. And, uh, and then a few days later, he attended a memorial for Philando Castile. And that is where I think he first shared his, his harrowing tale of being racially profiled, supposedly by the police. Let's listen to that. Should be a profile for these two. Uh, matter of fact, I was just pulled over Saturday. Your know, pretext will stop it. You, know, you don't have a front license plate. Yeah, I got a ticket for my license. Anyway, I thought we weren't doing pretextual stops here exactly. in the state. Listen. But we are. Yes. You know, Just so we we're clear. Still getting driving while black tickets here That's in true. this state. Matter of fact, in St. Paul. Uh, you know, so let's just call it what it is. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, but they turned deadly. You know, these, these traffic stops turned deadly, you know, because I'm in my car with this baseball hat, you know, and you can't tell I'm state representative John Thompson. Neither should I have to, to, to change my clothes. That's right. That part. Yeah. Listen. Yeah. Right. Yo, I'm, a, I'm a Minnesota state representative. I'm a lawmaker here. I can wear what I want to wear. That's I right. You have to That's be right. profiled. That Yo, part. This is ridiculous. Yo. And it was, by the way, it was a sergeant here in St. Paul. Mm. Wait. Okay, so he was pulled over, um, as you heard him describe there, uh, saying it was a pretextual stop. And uh, basically racially profiling, they're just looking for an excuse because they saw, according to him, they saw a black man in a car with a hat on and they said, uh, let's, let's pull him over. I guess his, his claim, what's being claimed here, is that what cops, every time they see a black guy in a car, they just automatically pull him over? Because there's, there's a, a problem there because, you know, if, if that's how you operated as a police officer in St. Paul, you'd never be able to do anything else aside from just pull over black drivers. It's, it's just kind of an absurd claim. Now, he got pulled over because he w- had, didn't have a front license plate. You're supposed to have a front license plate. Um, you could say it's a ticky-tack thing to get pulled over for that. Okay, maybe it is. We, 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 see, we could have a conversation about cops pulling people over on ticky-tack things. You know, you get pulled over, given a ticket because you're you know, headlight is out or something. There's an argument for that as well, because that's a safety issue. But we could talk about that. We, we, a police officers spending far too much time on this kind of thing. Are there more important things they could be doing? Are there other things that they themselves would probably prefer to be doing? So that's a, that's a, a perfectly reasonable conversation. The problem is that the, 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 that conversation gets totally drowned out by all of the racial rhetoric, because it has to become a racial issue. Never mind the fact that I myself have gotten pulled over, because if the, I've gotten pulled over for that exact reason, actually, not having a front license plate. Depending on the state you're in, um, you know, in in Tennessee, you you don't have to have a front license plate, but depending on the state you're in, that's you're supposed to have one. I've been pulled over for that, and yeah, it was kind of annoying. Why are you bothering me about this? Does it really matter? Who even cares if I have a front license plate? But it's the law. The cops enforcing it. I was respectful. That was it. It was the interaction was over in in five minutes, and I went about my day. I didn't try to escalate it into something else because I didn't want it to turn into anything else. I just wanted to get back to my day. That's it. I didn't want this to be a thing. But Representative John Thompson decided to make it into a thing, and uh, and then there was a big controversy that, around this. And finally, St. Paul Police Chief Todd Axtell, uh, he decided to fight back. Uh, you know, he, he said he was going to look into it, and he did. And then he came out and said that this the whole stop was by the books. It was completely fine. Nothing inappropriate happened at all. And he was pulled over because he didn't have the front license plate. And then they found out that he was driving on a suspended license as well. Um. And then they also, and the police chief not only explained this, but he, dem- he is now demanding an apology from the state representative, which is exactly, see, going on the offense, that is the, that's the right approach. It's one thing to be defensive and say, hey, gee, we looked into it, and no, I don't think the, the, uh, our officer did anything wrong. That's one thing. You got to go a step further and say, no, nothing wrong. There was nothing bad that happened here. You know it. Okay, you're defaming this person. You need to apologize. You're the bad guy here. That's what the police chief is doing to his credit. He also released the body cam footage. 
And uh, the whole thing, it's, it's raw footage, like 15 minutes long. Nothing of note happens except for at the very end when Representative um, Thompson starts claiming to the police officer that he's being racially profiled. Here's what happened there. Where'd you pull me over again? Man? No front plate. And then the way you Thank took you. off from man, the light back me. there. I'm too old to run from the police, man. You profiled me because you looked me dead in the face and I got a ticket for driving while black. You mm-hmm. pulled me over because you saw a black face in this car, brother. And you, and I, there's no way in here I'm taking off with you behind me. You looked at me in this car, you looked in this car and busted you turn and got behind my car. It's and on, that's the reason why you, I know, I know. But what, what I'm saying is what you're doing is wrong to black men. And you need to stop that. Thank you so much. But this ticket means nothing to me. No, no, no. no. I'm going I'm to always have a great day. What right. I'm saying is you will stop racially profiling black men in their cars, sir. No stop doing that. Profile. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. Yes, you were, bro. You, you saw a black you, man you driving in this car. Stops that I made I, it don't make no difference. You pull me over profiling. because you're profiling me. Uh, there's no way he could be convinced otherwise. Because what we're told now is this is where we're at. Um according to BLM and guys like uh, Representative Tom- Thompson there, any time a police of- officer pulls over a black person, it's racial profiling. Doesn't matter the reason. Every single time. You know, it's, it's an unfalsifiable claim. He's waving the ticket around saying, see, you ticketed me for, for driving while black. No, no, I did. I, the ticket is for not having a front license plate. I've given out a lot of tickets for that. The white and black people. You don't like that law or that rule, take it up with your legislator. You are a legislator. Maybe you should pass a law or something if you don't like that rule. That's, that's the great irony here that I almost missed until just right now. A lot of times, the problem that you think you have with the police, it's not with the police. It's with the people making these laws. If you don't want the police enforcing these laws, take it up with the people who made them. Cops are not are not lawmakers. They're law enforcers. And so if you don't think that there's ever an appropriate time for a police officer to pull a black man over on a, on a, on a charge like that, then that charge shouldn't exist. All right, finally, I wanted to mention this very briefly, um, if we have time. USA Today story here. Uh, I, I don't think there's ever been a time when lots of people in media have been freaking out about some gun-related thing, and I find myself agreeing with them. But today is the exception. And I'm, I'm not freaking out, I should say, so it's not full agreement. But I agree with the criticism, I have to say. There's, so there's first time for everything. So here's, here's the, um, the thing that has prompted the backlash, much of it from the anti-gun crowd. And it's a gun. It's a real gun. You can see the picture there. A real functional gun made to look like a Lego toy. So here's a story from USA Today. They say a Utah-based gun company faces backlash this week after selling a Glock handgun a handgun casing that transforms the weapon to look like a children's Lego toy. The gun company Culper Precision agreed to remove the product from its website and not make or sell anything like this in the future after Lego reached out, according to a statement from Lego to, to USA Today. The Block 19 kit, which uh, borrows from Lego's characteristic red, blue, and yellow brick design, Debuted last week with a website set, website page touting it as, a, as super fun. The site said, quote, This is just one small way to break the rhetoric from anti-gun folks and draw attention to the fact that the shooting sports, that the shooting sport is super fun. Um, here's the thing. Guns are fun. Shooting is fun. 30 rounds full auto is fun. And uh, this was supposed to, this was supposed to what, break the rhetoric from the anti-gun crowd? No, you've just given them ammunition, so to speak, in an almost literal way. This this, this will really show the anti-gun crowd what's what. And then a few days later, you're taking the thing off in shame. Yeah, this is a stupid and horrible idea. Um, And I don't need to give you the whole disclaimer about how I'm a gun owner and a Second Amendment absolutist and all of that, because I am. And you already know that, but it's in part because I'm a gun owner and I take this stuff seriously that I hate this so much. First of all, guns are not toys. Okay. Yeah, it's fun to go shoot. Shooting is a fun hobby. Collecting guns is fun. All that stuff is fun. Nothing wrong with that stuff being fun. It's still not a toy though. Um, It's a weapon. And yes, it's up to you to practice good gun safety, keep your weapons locked up and all of that out of reach of children. But to go out of your way to intentionally make a gun enticing to small children, 
to intentionally purposefully make it look like a, a, a toy to kids? That's inexcusable. And there's no reason to do it. The only reason to do it is, is um, it looks cool. And it doesn't, by the way. It looks gaudy and hideous. But looking cool doesn't outweigh the downside, which is pretty severe. And by the way, speaking of police officers, if gun, if gun companies were to go in this direction and start making guns that look like this, now you've just made a cop's job a thousand times harder. And now you put them in an even more impossible situation. And you put a lot of potentially innocent people in danger, including kids. So, horrible idea. And I'm glad they took it down. All right, let's move on now to reading the YouTube comments. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll go here first. Free T Spirit says, uh, referring to the, he's referring to the video of the man trying to breastfeed, which we played yesterday. So this is a thousand percent disgusting and child abuse. I've just thrown up in my own mouth. It is disgusting and child abuse, but I have to say, um, not to be play semantics here, but I'm interested in your use of the word own. I've just thrown up in my own mouth. In who, in who else's mouth would you throw up in? I guess is my question. Don't answer that. Rod Royal says IPAs are for the pretentious. Miller Lite actually tastes great. It doesn't taste like anything. What do you mean it tastes great? So, I, I don't get this. This thing you hear from people, I, it's a pretentious to drink an IPA. So flavor is pretentious? Beer is supposed to have flavor. That's why it exists. So it's pretentious for a thing to actually perform its intended function, you're saying? Is it pretentious for a car to start when you turn the ignition? Do you get mad when your car starts and you say, hey, man, this thing is so pretentious. Calm down, car. What are you trying to prove here? That's why beer exists. At least it's one of the reasons. That's why I drink it, because it tastes great. Miller Lite, it's not even that it tastes bad. It has no taste at all. Um, Spencer says, small families are not happier in any way. I was an only child. My parents were not happy, and I was pretty lonely. I have made it one of my most important life goals to have at least three kids. I have one already, and we'll have another two if possible. Megan and Harry can go to hell. Uh, yeah, I, 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 look, any size family can be happy. But the idea that you maximize happiness in a family by having fewer kids uh, is absurd. And finally, Scott says, day 100 of begging Matt to play the banjo for us. Well, Scott, I know I did promise. I do. I remember my promises. And I know I promised. And you've been putting this in the comments for 100 days. And I promised a, a while ago that if you keep this going for 100 days, I will play the banjo. And I am a man of my word. I have a few moments. We are running a little bit behind, but um, I have a few moments. So I can now play you a little ditty on the banjo. As an avid banjo player myself, I do this all the time. The, all the offices here are constantly filled with the noise of me, the beautiful sounds of me playing the banjo because I'm such an avid banjo player. Um, but before I play, I just got to make sure I get this thing tuned. Like I said, we only have a couple, a, a moment or two, but I'll just, let me get this thing tuned and then I'll play something for you. Just got to make sure. I, I obviously know how to tune a banjo because I play banjo so often. Okay, I think that's tuned. Um, and then you just want to, you want to tap on it. Make sure there's nothing inside it, like any small animals. No? Okay. Just give it a, a sniff. Make sure it's still good. You know, it hasn't been left out in the sun or anything. And uh, let me just get it tuned real quick again. Just gonna make sure I tune it. Um, Cause I, I look. I made a promise that I'm gonna I'm gonna keep my promise. Okay, I think it's tuned. Um, yeah, feels right. Let me tune it again. All right, and uh, uh well, yeah, actually it's. We, we just ran out of time. I'm sorry. I, uh, I only had a few moments, and we just ran out of time. I got to move on to the next segment. I, re I really wanted to play it. I was going to play it. Uh, I, it was my plan, but we just ran out of time. I think that qualifies, though, as keeping my promises, which I always do. You know, if Candace frequents anything, it's the trending sidebar on Twitter and her own show, uh, which is good that she frequents her own show. You know, I've, I've found generally you want to make sure that you're frequenting your shows. 
I'm just reading the copy. That's what they told me to say, and I'm saying it. I'm a parrot. I just read what's put in front of me. Whether she's calling Donald Trump uh, or joking with Adam Carolla or sitting down with MMA fighter Benil Darish to discuss the Marxist ideology his family is fleeing from, you can be sure any time spent watching Candace is time well spent. She will be there. She'll be frequenting, but she'll also be offering her opinions, which are always very interesting. Her latest episode dropped this week, so if you haven't tuned in yet, I highly recommend that you do. You can watch Candace live every day, or rather every Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, only on dailywire.com slash Candace. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I, for one, love my freedom. Even though I'm an authoritarian, theocratic fascist, I enjoy my own freedom, at least. Uh, I in no way intend to allow an authoritarian dictator to take it from me and to replace it with baseless lockdown measures or the indoctrination of my children into a leftist cult. And neither should you. And that's why Ben Shapiro wrote The Authoritarian Moment, because if we want to shut down this ideology that that uh, proceeds an authoritarian government. We need to help every American understand as much as they can about how we reach this point, And then really importantly, how we can actually fight back. What can we do going forward? So unless you want to live under an authoritarian regime intent on decreasing your freedom and increasing their power, it's time to start fighting back. Get the authoritarian moment. Uh, and you can do that by pre-ordering on Amazon now or Barnes & Noble or at any other major bookseller uh, to get your copy. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Yeah, we have on the show reviewed many different types of TikTok videos, which uh, I'm sure you've noticed and are grateful for. But the one genre we haven't spent much time on is abortion TikTok. It's mostly for my own sanity and emotional health that I've avoided wading into these waters. And yet I find that I can no longer avoid it, especially as I so often see these videos posted on Twitter or Facebook and by people who sincerely believe that some sort of brilliant and unanswerable argument has been presented. So for our daily cancellation today, we're going to play some of these clips and uh, respond to them. Now, there are many abortion-related videos on the platform where women simply brag about their own abortions and pretend to think that it's funny that they've just murdered their own child. Those are horrifying and sad and infuriating and evil, but there isn't much else to say about them and certainly no reason to play them. It's no mystery why a woman might react that way to her abortion. It's a rationalization. It's a defense mechanism. These are women who've done a horrible thing, and they know they've done a horrible thing at some level. They know it. And now they're overcompensating. Because people who are happy about the decisions they make don't have to make videos convincing strangers that they're happy about their decisions, as a general rule. Now, it may be true that some of these women have successfully deluded themselves, but that only lasts so long. The fact is, despite what lies the abortion industry tells, abortion is not the undoing of a pregnancy. It's not a reset or reverse button allowing you to go back to being a happy, carefree, childless person. In pregnancy, you become a mother. In abortion, you become the mother of a dead child. So there's a loss. There's an absence. And you will feel it eventually. That's a fact. So all of the, 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 the videos you see, I'm so happy about it. Um, these are people who have deluded themselves, and that's all that is. But let's move on to the actual arguments. We're going to play a few videos here of uh, people on TikTok presenting their best arguments for abortion. And let's start with this one. If a 16-year-old wanted to adopt a child, the government wouldn't allow it. She isn't done with her education. She isn't financially stable yet. And she isn't a legal adult. But if she gets pregnant, the government can ban her from getting an abortion. How is that logical? Hmm. Uh, a few issues here. First of all, 16-year-olds are not banned from getting abortions. So that's, the whole premise of this argument is wrong. Um, they're not. 16-year-olds can get abortions. Uh, unfortunately, they can get abortions. Though in some states, they need parental consent. In, in other states, they don't need parental consent at all. They can just walk in and get the abortion. So no need to worry, ma'am. Your dreams have come true. Teenage girls can kill their babies and are killing their babies. So your utopia is a reality. Congratulations. But let's pretend that you're correct for a moment. Let's pretend that 16-year-olds can't adopt, which they can't, and also can't get abortions. And you think there's, there's some kind of conflict between these two propositions. You ask how this would be logical. Well, let me tell you. Because the common thread is one of mental competence, maturity. A 16-year-old isn't mentally competent enough to adopt. She also isn't mentally competent enough to make the decision to take someone's life. 
That's a bit of a misnomer because nobody should be able to do that. There's no level of mental competence that should permit you to kill a baby. Even so, abortion is a choice which has a profound impact on two lives, at least. Her own, as the mother, and the life of her child, which she is ending. I would call that a profound impact. Is a 16-year-old old enough to analyze those ramifications and make a properly informed choice? No. But then, if she doesn't have the abortion, she'll be a mother, you say. Uh, you know, just, so, so what about that? No, you're wrong. She's already a mother, as we have previously established. She's a mother at conception. The human has been conceived. That's done. That part is over, completed, fulfilled. The question is what to do about this child or with this child. You say she isn't old enough to care for the child. So what? She's old enough to kill it? I say that's insane and morally grotesque and evil and also illogical. Instead, we could try to find someone who can care for the child if she can't. And, 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 and uh, it, by the way, we, we hear about the, ba- the you know, kids who are up for adoption and, and they can't find anyone to adopt them. And, well, okay, well, it sounds so easy. You put the child up for adoption, put the baby up for adoption. And they're just going to be in the system forever and no one's going to adopt them. That's not true. Okay. Now, it is true, sadly and tragically, that um, older kids who end up in the system, oftentimes it's, it's very difficult to find a family that will take them in. And that's a terrible thing. That is not the case for babies. There is a waiting list a million miles long of families waiting to adopt babies. So a 16-year-old can't, has a baby, can't care for the baby. You put that, that child up for adoption and he will be adopted by a loving family very quickly. One other thought, though. Uh, you don't think 16-year-olds are old enough to be parents? Okay. Uh, are they old enough to choose their gender? What do you think about that? I think I already know your answer. Let's watch another and see if uh, these arguments get any better. Let's talk about abortion and specifically the heartbeat bill. When someone gets in an accident and they're considered brain dead, no one considers it morally wrong to pull that person's plug or end their life. Because although that person has a beating heart, they aren't a conscious being. They have no brain activity. Here's another example. Why do most people not consider it morally wrong to kill an insect, but do consider it morally wrong to kill a cat or a dog? They both have beating hearts. The difference between the two is level of consciousness. A dog is very aware of its existence and creates relationships with the things around them. Whereas an insect just lives off of instinct. They aren't aware that they exist, they just do. The thing I'm really confused about is why all of a sudden when it comes to abortion, we allow a beating heart to signify life. When in all other aspects of our life, a beating heart doesn't mean anything. What matters is level of consciousness. And a fetus in the first trimester does not have consciousness. Uh, I I don't know where to begin here. She's built a tower of false assumptions and baseless assertions, all resting on a false premise taped up with red herrings and non sequiturs. So let's run through some things very quickly. Number one, you have no idea how much consciousness a, quote, fetus possesses. Number two, you have no idea if a dog is aware of its existence. I doubt that it is, personally. Does a, does a dog have an I concept? Is it aware of itself as an I, a self? Can a dog think to itself and, 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 and can think, oh, I am doing this, I am doing that? I doubt it. We could debate that, but nobody really knows. Number three, you say heartbeat doesn't matter in any other area of life. Really? So it's all about consciousness? So you're arguing that it should be considered morally permissible to kill anything that is not conscious or that we assume isn't conscious? Okay, then, well, how would you feel if I went and chopped down 100 trees for no reason? Let's start with that. What if I captured 1,000 eagles and shot them all and threw their bodies in a dumpster? How would would that rub you? Are eagles more conscious than unborn children? I don't think so. Four, if consciousness is the measure of worth, then what about levels of consciousness among and within born humans? Consciousness is not one set thing. There are degrees of it. A one-year-old is conscious, but certainly is less aware than a 10-year-old. Does a 10-year-old then possess more moral worth? What about a 30-year-old as compared to an 85-year-old dementia patient? So you've created this scale of worth, this way of measuring things. And I don't think you've thought about where it leads, or maybe you have, which is even worse. Number five, here's a big one, important point. Even if I agreed with your whole premise and all of your assertions, which I don't, 
you've got a major problem. The unborn child, unlike the brain dead person or the insect, is only in this limited conscious state temporarily. We know that he will soon have more consciousness. He is headed towards that point with every passing second, inevitably, if you leave him to his own devices. So what if we knew, take the brain dead person. What if we knew that person would wake up in three weeks? Still okay to kill them? See, that's the real analogy here. A person with limited mental functioning who we know for a fact will soon have full mental functioning. In any other context, would you say that it's okay to exploit that limited window of reduced consciousness and kill the person? But hey, he's not conscious right now. Let's kill him. But that's bad news for anyone who's ever, uh, I don't know, gone to sleep. Let's try one more video. Do conservatives realize that by banning abortion, their taxes are going to go up by a lot? Rich women will always have access to abortion no matter what the law is. They will always be able to get it. So forcing poor women to have children that they cannot afford, even in the cases of rape and incest, means the state has to pay for it, meaning your tax dollars. Romania's welfare system completely collapsed when they banned abortion in the 70s. And at that time, their population was about 20 million. Texas has a population of 29 million. Wow. Mic drop. Mind blown. Taxes will go up? Do I realize that taxes will go up if abortion is banned? Here's a better question. Um, do I give a damn? See, I, I, I'm not sure if your assumptions are actually true or not, the taxes will go up, but, but if they are, who cares? Do you realize that the whole point of the pro-life cause, the whole argument we're making is that human life has objective and inherent value? Our point is that a human's value is not contingent on how convenient that life is to those around it. If we believe that, we'd be pro-abortion like you, but we don't, so we're not. So if taxes go up because abortion is banned, okay. I don't like paying taxes, but I'm not going to support mass slaughter and genocide just to avoid it. I mean, we could also reduce our taxes by just killing everybody on welfare right now. How does that strike you? See, I'm not a murderous sociopath who reduces human life down to a matter of mere dollars and cents. That's not my gig. That's not my stance. It's yours, remember? So speak for yourself. Or better yet, stop speaking because you and the rest of abortion TikTok are today absolutely canceled. And we'll leave it there for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Godspeed. The Matt Walsh Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Production manager, Pavel Vodosky. The show is edited by Sasha Tolmachov. Our audio is mixed by Mike Koromina. Hair and makeup is done by Nika Geneva. And our production coordinator is McKenna Waters. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Dr. Fauci recommends that three-year-olds mask up. Drug overdose deaths hit the highest level ever recorded, according to the CDC. And the feds spend a fortune prosecuting the horn guy from the Capitol riot. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.